Okay, our topic for today is the three prerequisites for truth. The three prerequisites for finding truth. Okay. This is a this is a lesson in how to study the Bible but more importantly, how to decipher what is true. As we know, there are hundreds or thousands, if not millions of interpretations of scriptures or concepts in the Bible. Everyone has their own spin to contribute. And this is exactly why we have a multiplicity of Christian churches and doctrines. But Jesus said um, in John 23, John 4, verses 23 and 24. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So in these last days, True worshipers must be established in truth to worship God correctly. Otherwise, the worship is pointless, and in some cases, it's even detrimental. Consider this. Paul gives the order of the spiritual gifts. Now, I'm going to say, I'm going to read Ephesians 4, and then I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians 12, because it's... These these uh, these are parallel verses. They mirror each other, but one is slightly different. So we'll read Ephesians 4, 11 through 14 first. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we henceforth no longer be children, or be no more children tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, thereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him, into all things, even Christ. Oh. Now we're going to go to 1 Corinthians, and this is a slightly different. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. It says, and he has appointed these in the church. First, apostles. Second, prophets. Third, teachers. After that, miracles. Then healings helps administration varieties of tongues. Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians 12 reveals that the order is significant in establishing their level of importance in the kingdom of God. So now we're going to go over the significance of the order uh, of the gifts. Okay. First, God gave the apostles to establish a firm foundation in the Christian church, right? The apostles were God-fearing only men. They were fear, absolutely fearless, personally handpicked by Jesus. Their mission was to spread and write the foundation of the gospel. The Bible says in Galatians 1, Paul, an apostle of, uh, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father. That's Galatians 1.1. 1, 1. Number two, secondly, and of extreme importance is the gift of prophecy. Prophets were chosen by God to rebuke, exhort, expound scriptures, prophesy, and send divine messages of warning or promise to the people of God. Three, next in line are the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. They are to teach and instruct the word of God according to the principles laid down by the apostles and the interpretations of the prophets. 
In view of this, notice how the gifts of ministers, teachers, miracles and healings, administrations and tongues only follow after, never before the first two gifts, the apostles and prophets. Why is this sequence necessary? The functions of the latter gifts prove useless without first establishing a solid foundations. Evangelists, pastors, teachers must admonish according to the word written by the apostles and the prophets. The administration's teachings, ministries, healing, and charities are vehicles to establish people in the truth. Miracles, healings, and tongues are supernatural designs to strengthen believers and draw non-believers to the gospel of Christ. Look at Acts 2, 6 through 12. We're not going to read that right now. But those things were, were used to awaken the heathens to see the power of God during the time of the first Pentecost. So now look at the state of things that we have in the Christian world today. We have proponents who advocate one special gift or over another. We have whole churches that have been established over a gift such as the tongues or healings, but without practicing or teaching according to the word of God. And they are misleading their followers. So there are three things needed to find the truth. Three things needed to find the truth. The first of these is a willing heart, and that's found in John 7, 17. The Lord explicitly says what man needs to figure out the truth. We're going to read that in just a second. So I remember when I was on my own journey for truth, I was hungry and honest to find out what truth was. I encountered many other doctrines, Jehovah's Witness, Mormons. I even started with studying Eastern philosophies. But the one thing that remained true in my quest, my quest for truth is that I honestly want to know what to do. In fact, I didn't even know God was real. But starting in a place where I was honest and whatever God showed me, I was willing to do, this enabled God to lead me and show me through various avenues what truth was step by step. It didn't come all at once. The second criteria is that we must test all doctrines by searching the Bible and making sure it agrees with the former testimonies of truth given throughout the ages. We will delve into this later on in this presentation. Third, when we search the scriptures, we need to make sure that we are rightly dividing the word of God. Now, I've seen this a lot lately. Some will take one verse singularly and build an entire, entire doctrinal approach from it, ignoring the sure foundation of using multiple sources throughout the Bible. And this is just not good scholarship by any standards. Those who isolate a verse and ignore the, the, the rest on the subject are hopelessly trapped in a... Um, in a, in a trap of their own setting. Their knowledge will never increase beyond their own limitations. So now we're here at John 7, 17. If any man will do his will. I'm going to read the King James Version, but I've provided several versions just for you to look at. I like to do that, look at several different versions to see if I can glean something more from it. King James uh version it says if any man will do his will he will know of the doctrine whether it be of god or whether i speak of myself so the very first condition god is giving us an insur assurance that if we are just willing to do his will we know we can and will be led into all truth and herein lies the reason for the existence of so many paths, so many doctrines, and so many churches. It is because men are unwilling and have a stopping point. This is a self-inflicted stopping point. While others have gone further and stopped, and then still others have gone further than them and stopped, and some go all the way. 
It has to do with the heart. So now we need to answer an all-important question. What is the testimony? Because we, Adventists, we know, you know, from Isaiah 8, we've heard this. It's all throughout the spirit of prophecy. And if you're not Adventist, I'll explain what the spirit of prophecy is. What is the testimony? In Isaiah 8, there's several warnings, but we know this one is the most famous. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, there is no light in them. Isaiah 8.20. Let's look at another verse. This one is 1 John 5.9. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For the testimony of God is this, that he has testified concerning his son. Let's read one more verse. 1 Corinthians 2, 1. And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. That's Paul. So let's get into the meat of this this study. What is the testimony? Okay, we're going to go all the way to the book of Revelation. We're going to go to John the Revelator. And the context is that John, he's on the island of Patmos. He's exiled. And during this time, it's a wonderful time for him to receive from God's spirit all types of visions. And he sees some astounding things. In fact, his visions, you know, kind of replicate or match some of the visions that Daniel saw way, way in in times past, you know, way before John's time. And we see in Daniel and the Revelation, a continuation of the beast that Daniel saw in Revelation. In fact, Sister White said all books of the Bible meet and end in the book of Revelation. So what is the Revelation? Now let's look at this very closely. Because it says in the very first uh chapter of revelation revelation 1 1 through 3 what the revelation actually is it says the revelation of jesus christ which god gave him to show his ser- his servants things which must shortly take place and he sent it and signified it by his angel to his servant john who bore witness to the word of god and to the testimony of jesus christ to all things that he saw Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Now, there's a few things that we need to take from this. We we shouldn't let pass us by from this verse, okay, these verses. John is going to see things which must shortly take place, things that are going to happen in the future. So he's also writing a prophecy for us, right? Whose testimony is it, though? It's the testimony of Jesus Christ. And then there's a blessing to it. The blessing has three uh, stipulations. You have to read the testimony. You have to hear the words of the prophecy. And then you have to keep the things which are written in it. And you have to comply when you get the understanding. And it says, for the time is near. So we know that everything that's happening in the revelation is for the Christian dispensation. What is the revelation? Let's read another verse that we know all too well. Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus. Okay. There's a couple things to note about this. Remember, in the first book of Revelation, John is told that he will see things that will take place later in the Earth's history. The dragon, of course, is the devil, 
And if we use the Bible's universal symbolism of a woman being a symbol of God's church, we can assume that the devil is enraged at God's church at a particular time, so much so that he goes off to make war with her offspring. Those, that's, her, that's her converts. This last day church has two distinct characteristics. They, one, keep the commandments of God, and they, two, have the testimony of, of, of Jesus Christ. Notice that it's not just one. We have a lot of sex within uh, Christianity where they are keeping the commandments of God. We have, you know, the feast days. There's a big revival of Christians that are going back to keeping the feast days. But that, the, but the keeping the commandments of God is not the only requirement for this remnant church. They must have the testimony of Jesus Christ. We just learned that the revelation is the testimony of Jesus and it's called a prophecy. So now we're going to get into what the Bible says explicitly about the testimony of Jesus. And that's in Revelation 19.10. And he says, and I fell at his feet to worship him. John is writing this. He's speaking about the angel that he's encountered. And this is what the angel says. But he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So let's recap a little bit about this. To the law and to the testimony, except in the testimony. So the Bible is endeavoring to teach us explicitly and by example, as we are going to see this principle, the principle of this testimony of Jesus, we're going to learn that the testimony has been since the beginning of time. There was the oral testimony in the old dispensation. And what we, we begin to see a writing of manuscripts beginning with Moses. And then there's the written and oral uh, uh, testimony in the new dispensation. Let's look at a chart to help us understand. Prophesied until uh, John. Okay, this is a chart that I think was very, very important for people to understand, a chart that I made. I have a background in graphic design. So Jesus explains that what prophesied uh he he gives the phrase prophesied until john and this is i'm going to go to another slide but prophesied until john a lot of christians use this to say there are no prophets until after and, and until uh, after john okay after john there's no prophets because of the statement that jesus made in matthew 11:13 and it says, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. But remember what we said about right, rightly dividing the word of God. We have to look um, at the totality of what the Bible is saying about prophets and prophecy. And in Matthew 5, 17, 18, Jesus seemingly contradicts himself because he says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, to heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Let's go back to the chart. Okay, so the first, we see a dividing line at John the Baptist, which Christ himself sat. This is in the BC era. And we look and it starts with Adam and it goes down to Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Jacob, Moses, who wrote the first five books of the Bible. Then there's Joshua, Samuel, Deborah. So these are the prophets in the old dispensation. These were what I like to call direct word prophets. They did not have to refer to the scriptures for there wasn't any scriptures for them to refer to. They, be, they were the ones that began writing manuscripts that would become scripture. They received word from God. They communicated it to fellow man. And they received it by dreams, visions, and visitations from angels. And even Jesus, because there were times when Jesus came down and spoke with them in the form of an angel 
or a man. So these, this, this group of prophets went all the way to John the Baptist, okay? And then you see at John the Baptist, you see Jesus and the, and the disciples or apostles, they were all around the same time, right? And understand that John the Baptist and Jesus and the disciples, they begin to refer to the scriptures in their teaching. They were not only giving prophecies for the future, but they became interpretive prophets. So they must refer, the interpretive section of the prophets must refer to the formally written scriptures in their teaching, and it must agree, because now they have part of that holy manuscript that will become the, the complete the Bible. They received light on the scripture, then communicated it to their fellow man. They also wrote manuscripts that would become scripture or foundational do doctrines, and they received it through dreams, visions, and visitations from angels, divine impressions. So now we're going to travel down to the Dark Ages period, the 1260 years, and that's like a period of captivity for the Christian church. We remember that shortly after the crucifixion, Christians are, are getting persecuted. That's why we have the catacombs, and we know Nero you know, killed the Christians and put them in the um the 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 theater that they have over there. I forgot what it's called. But after that, Christianity and paganism gets combined together with the Roman papal power. That period is a church and state um joining together and that ends religious liberty okay for the christian and so god has to do something the protestant reformation begins he raises up a catholic priest who begins to question you know what's going on in the church and why can't it you know regular people just read the scriptures and he begins to read the scriptures he had he, excuse me, he was not a Catholic priest, he was a monk. He had access because he was inside the structure of the church. So the Protestant Reformation begins with the father of Protestantism, Martin Luther. And then on, on down, that same testimony continues because the church is coming back to where they're supposed to be because now they have the light of the scriptures. We have John Knox who taught the Holy Spirit. He established the Presbyterian Church. We have John Wesley, he, he established the Saved by Grace Doctrine and the Methodist Church, Alexander Campbell. He said, hey, we're not supposed to be sprinkling, we're supposed to baptize by immersion. He established the Baptist Church. And then the lesser known uh, reformers, William Miller, God gave him special light about the second advent and the 2300 days. Now the second advent wasn't, uh, wasn't taught before William Miller. But it's a very popular scripture. So we see how if God is in this testimony, it has staying power. Just like Christianity started as a small sect of Judaism, where are we now? Christianity is the biggest religion in the world. And then we go on to Ellen White in 1844. She understands the mistake that William Miller made in his computation there was no mistake in the computation a significant event occurred but she gives clarity and she has visions about what that event was and she realized that the judgment was was opening up in heaven and god was beginning to go through the souls of every every person that claimed him so he can have his reward with him when he comes right she also began to see the sanctity of the sabbath as she studied that sanctuary truth and she gave that to the world she said the sabbath is still something that's in in place for christians today okay so we're going to go through one more verse how important is prof prophecy second peter uh, 119 through 20 it should say 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 through 20. 
we have also a more sure word of prophecy where unto you do well that you take heed as a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This, this here is the, the Bible again explicitly teaching hey, these prophecies, they're not open to common man. You have to be specially selected of God. So if you're just, you know, a regular average Joe Christian and looking at the book of Revelation or the cryptic visions in Ezekiel or Daniel, and you're trying to explain that and you go in to publish a book, it's not, it's not from that same spirit. It's not, you're not moving from the Holy Ghost. Those are private interpretations. It's important for us to understand and remember that the same spirit who wrote the Bible is the same spirit required to interpret it. So many men have endeavored to interpret the prophecies of the Bible, but God has not inspired them. And because of this, we see the most multiplicity of sects and doctrines in Christianity we, we see today. So we're going to take a look at the testimony of Jesus throughout the ages, and I'll try to move through this fast. Seven examples of believing or disbelieving the testimony. Now, this started with the entrance of this earth on the universe's history. But at the be very beginning of the world's history, the first testimony that was given on this earth was given by Jesus. And he said, do not eat the fruit thereof. It says, Genesis 3, 3, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it. Neither shall you touch it, lest she die. Eve really believed the words of Satan, but her belief did not save her from the penalty of sin. She took of the fruit and did eat. It was grateful to the taste, and she and she as she ate, she seemed to feel a vivifying power and imagined herself entering upon a higher state of existence. And that was Page Charts and Prophets, page fifty six, fifty seven. So the very first testimony was given by God and, and Christ. Do not eat the fruit thereof. That was the one test that our parents had. But they believed the deceiver's testimony. The results of that is that they rejected the testimony of Jesus in the Garden of Eden. Our first parents failed the test. As a consequence, they're kicked out of their Eden home. They're subject to death, which God never intended to man, for man and subject to live a life of hardship and suffering. Let's move to our, our second testimony, which is the flood. This was given by Enoch and Noah. God will destroy the earth with the flood. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 through 6, it says, this is the history of the heavens of the earth, excuse me, in the day that the Lord God made the heavens, made the earth in the heavens before any plant of the field was in the earth and before any herb of the field had grown. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was no man to till the ground, but a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Okay, so... This sets us up for why this message is rejected. There's a widespread belief because of a normalcy bias. A normalcy bias is simply when you have a bias that something will not happen because you personally have not experienced it. And so this is why it's so hard sometimes for people to accept these prophecies in their generation. And that's exactly what we encounter now. And you tell people, about some of the prophecies for this generation. The results of this, and uh, well, let me go back to this. So God does speak to Noah, and God, because Genesis 6, 13 says, and God said to Noah, the end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. 
So notice how God spoke to Noah of his plans of destroying the earth. And in turn, Noah gives the testimony of this prophecy to the people of living on earth at that time. I want to read a quote from Patriots and Prophets. It says, while God's servants are giving the message that the end of all things is at hand, the world is absorbed in amusement and pleasure seeking. There is a constant round of excitement that causes indifference to God and prevents the people from being impressed by the truths which alone can save them from coming destruction. So they had 120 years of mercy, but it only proved to harden their hearts. 120 years, Moses was preaching the testimony of Jesus. They became scoffers and enemies of truth, and they suffered death by the flood, a judgment of God. It was very important for them in their generation to believe and act upon that testimony. Let's go to uh, example number three, Sodom and Gomorrah. The third testimony, it was given by angels. Angels appeared as men unto Lot. And we all know the story where, you know, God gets, showed man the plan. He, he told Abraham what he was going to do. And then Abraham pleaded and interceded for his fellow man. And, you know, if there was just five righteous men there, the, that city would have been spared, but there wasn't. And in Genesis, Genesis 17, um, 19, 17, excuse me, Genesis 19, 17, so it says, and it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, escape for thy life, look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest they be, thou be consumed. Patriots and Prophets, page 157 says, and now the last night of Sodom was approaching, but men perceived it not. While angels drew near on their mission of destruction, men were dreaming of prosperity and pleasure. The last day was like every other day that had come and gone. So angels appeared as men to Lot. They're warning him to get, to get out of the city. Lot's two daughters that were out of the house and their husbands did not believe. The Bible says he seemed as one joking. The results of that and Lot's hesitation which is notated in the Bible. Okay, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah happens. That's inevitable, right? But two of Lot's daughters and their family are destroyed in that destruction. They could have been saved. They could have listened to the testimony of the angels. They could have listened to their father. Lot's wife turns into a pillar of salt because she turns back to look the angels of the Lord had took Lot and his family by the hand and said, get out of the city. They would have been destroyed if they hadn't, the angels hadn't done that because they were moving too slow. Lot's wife turns and desires the city. And because that, she shows herself not worthy of life and turns into a pillar of salt. Lot and his two remaining daughters are spared and eventually flee to the mountains. The fourth testimony, Samuel and Saul, it was given by Samuel, a prophet and a priest, and who was judge all over Israel. He anointed the first king. But Saul kept disregarding the directives of Samuel because he did not recognize that it was the testimony of Jesus. He looked at Samuel as a man, but Samuel was in a special role. He was a prophet. He was a priest. The results are that the Saul's kingdom was lost to another. Okay. He therefore spent many years tormenting David, his replacement, to stop the testimony of Jesus or the prophet from being fulfilled. The results was the kingdom was lost to another, but Saul, in his obsession with trying to kill David, allowed Israel's defenses to get weak. He was overcome by the Philistines and killed, and his sons were also killed by the Philistines. Let's go to the next one. Our fifth example is the fifth testimony of significance given by Moses. And this was, so the, the pretext to this is because 
the context of the story is that the Israelites had seen the glory and, and miracles of the Lord in their journey out of Egypt. But now, a short time later, after encountering minor, minor difficulties, they not only doubt that they will receive the land flowing with milk and honey, but they rebel against the testimony. So much so that they are now talking of stoning Moses and Aaron. Moses and Aaron have to intercede to avert God's judgment against the presumption of the people. But a rebellion to what God is doing with Moses and Aaron, other leaders emerge, false prophets who once again cry peace and safety. It's basically a prosperity message in their day with deadly results. So number 16 goes to the whole story where Korah, Datham, and Abiram claimed they would not submit to Moses and would take them into the land, even though God said anyone who is over the age of, I believe it was 20, will fall in the wilderness. And so there, there's a big showdown because Korah, Dathan, and Byram, they were leaders in Israel. A lot of people followed them, and a lot of Israelites believed their testimony instead of the testimony of Jesus. And the results are the earth opened up and fire came down. The earth opened up and swallowed Korah, Datham, and Abiram and their families, and then the fire came down, an additional judgment of, on princes and the rebellious individuals killed. Okay, so the sixth example we have is Elijah versus the prophets of Baal. The sixth testimony given by Elijah is follow God. Get rid of your idols. And God gave Elijah, as the prophet of Israel, a testimony of repent or deal with famine. And Elijah's life is very interesting. It's something that we all have to kind of take note of because we know that Elijah has been a type throughout the Bible. Jesus said, you know, that John the Baptist was as Elias. And then it says again, and I believe Joel that behold, I will send Elijah the prophet for the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So we have to look at the message that Elijah of old is saying. He's telling Israel, God's people, to get rid of all their idols, all their worldly ways. Now they've intermarried, the king himself has intermarried and taken a heathen wife. And because of that, the godless culture of the nations around them are infiltrating the Israelite people who are supposed to be beacons of light to everyone else. I know that um, Ellen White wrote that if they had been obedient, God would have just enlarged their borders until the knowledge of him filled the entire earth. But Israel always suffered this, right? They always went back. They, you know, several steps back. They took one step forward and several steps back because they always had this problem with worshiping idols. So God gave Elijah a testimony of repent or deal with famine. And the results are, because they didn't listen to this testimony, they suffered famine. Now there was real results, I mean, real consequences to this because it resulted in death for man and animals. And the, and the patriarchs and prophets uh, not sure if that's patients and prophets or prophets and kings. He talks about how people really died and they lost, you know, their and a lot of animals died and they lost their pros property, their prosperity and assets. And then we come down to a, a culmination where there's a pivotal pivotal moment where Israel is called to choose God or Baal, and swift judgment comes for the prophets of Baal. Now, the next one, the seven testimony is my personal favorite. And if anybody hasn't seen the movie of Jeremiah the prophet, it's so good. I recommend you go see it. But Jeremiah was a young man who was given a very, very unpopular message. And he, he went through a lot in giving this message to the king, to the, the nobles in Israel, to the princes, and to the priests. And everybody was against him because it was not a popular me message. Jeremiah's message was for Israel to surrender to the king of Babylon. 
Now, they wanted to do anything but this. They came up with alternate plans to flee to Egypt. He also warned the Jews not to flee to Egypt, but to submit to the king of Babylon. Well, false prophets rose up and told the king and tribe leaders to resist the king of Babylon. Their testimony was the opposite of what the testimony of God was to Jeremiah. The results was that Israel was destroyed and carried away. They were overcome. Many were killed and taken captive. And then the king's sons were killed right in front of him and his eyes were put out and he was imprisoned. As you can see, there was real consequences to rejecting the testimony for that generation. And we're going to end finally with the testimony of Jesus. When he comes as the Messiah, it is literally rejected. He's there in the flesh testifying of himself, his Messiahship. And he also talks about the destruction of, of, of Jerusalem. So Jesus testified of God, of himself, and the plan of salvation, the things of heaven. He totally disrupted the Jewish religion. And he also testified to flee Jerusalem when the sign appears. Let me read that to you. Matthew 24, 2. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Matthew 3, 7-9, he sees the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, okay? And he knows what they're going to do. He can see the, the, the future. He has the spirit of prophecy. The Bible says, but when he saw many of Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not think to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our, as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham in these stones. To sum up all the previous events that we have looked at, in the, the spirit of prophecy, the testimony of Jesus throughout the ages, starting with Adam, Jesus gives a parable in Luke 20, 9 through 17. And he says, then he began to tell the people this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard, leased it to vine dressers, and went into a far country for a long time. Now, at vintage time, he sent a servant to the vine dressers that they might give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the vine dressers beat him and sent him away empty handed. Again, he sent another servant, and they beat him also, and treated him shamefully, and sent him away empty handed. And again, he sent a third, and they wounded him and cast him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Probably they will respect him when they see him. But when the vine dressers saw him, they reasoned among themselves saying, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him that the inheritance may be ours. So they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, certainly not. Then he looked at them and said, well, then it is that that was written. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Whoever falls on that stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to power. And the chief priests and scribes, that very hour sought to lay hands on him, but they feared the people, for they knew he had spoken this parable against them. Let me go back. I want to read you something from the Spirit of Prophecy, The Great Controversy, page uh, 29. The long-suffering of God towards Jerusalem only confirmed the Jews in their stubborn impenitence. In their hatred and cruelty toward the disciples of Jesus, they rejected the last offer of mercy. 
Then God withdrew his protection from them and removed his restraining power from Satan and his angels, and the nation was left to the control of the leader she had chosen. Her children had spurned the grace of Christ, which would have enabled them to subdue their evil impulses, and now these became the conquerors. The children were not condemned for the sins of the parents, but when a full knowledge of all the light given to their parents, the children rejected the additional light granted to themselves, they became partakers of their parents' sins and filled up the measure of their iniquity. So the probation, the Jews had this one last chance. They've been rejecting it for a very long time as a body of, of believers in Israel. Okay, we've seen that. But now probation is over for the unbelieving Jews. The destruction of Jerusalem by Titus and fulfillment of Jesus's testimony, it says the, uh, not one Christian died in that because they believed Jesus's testimony. So there was really, there's so there here again, we're with these real practical, you know, life or death situations that all hinge on acceptance of a prophetic message of a truth and here we see the birth of the christian nation or the christian church and the fall of judaism we have to remember that they thought that they would be successful in squashing this tiny sect of believers okay they thought they could do that the jews together with the romans they thought they could squash them out but we know that this testimony of jesus will not die. This testimony of God will not die. It will accomplish its mission in every generation. And we'll see that it continues. So in summary, the testimony of Jesus sustains the church, whether it was the church in the old dispensation or the church in the new. The people of God are nothing without this testimony. This testimony started in the very beginning of Earth's history and has continued to the, down the annuals of time. Starting with the patriarchs and prophets, Adam, Enoch, and Noah, who preached the coming of the flood for 120 years, to Abraham, Israel, Joshua, and Moses, the latter of who prophesied and led Israel out of Egypt and into the promised land. Now we're going to the prophets and kings, David, Samuel, Nathan, Solomon, Elijah, and Elisha, Nahum, Nehemiah, Jeremiah, Zechariah, Ezra, Haggai, Isaiah, and Joel, who rebuked, guided, and exhorted God's people to obedience, and even through their captivity, Then came Jesus the Messiah, mankind's Lord and Savior, John the Baptist who prepared the way, and the disciples turned apostles who led the way. We can't forget Saul who turned into Paul, plucked as a brand from the fire, and who spread the gospel to the Gentiles. Neither should we forget John the Revelator who saw and wrote of things to come. Some say the testimony died there, but it hasn't. For out of the dark ages, the line of prophecy and truth shown through Martin Luther with righteousness by faith and John Wesley, who taught us saved by grace. There was Alexander Campbell, who taught baptism by immersion and John Knox, who taught us the truth of the Holy Spirit. These Protestant reformers and who are the father of the evangelicals you now see took the church step by step into the reformation needed and back to the Bible. Additionally, it is due time that we remember the humble farmer turned preacher, William Miller, who decoded the time prophecy of the 2300 days and was the first to teach the second coming of Christ. And additionally, Ellen G. White, the prophetess, who upon the light given her from heaven, proclaimed the start of this world's judgment and the restoration of the seventh day Sabbath honoring the divine law of the God of the universe. Beloveds, the chain of truth cannot and will not be broken 
as long as God sits on the throne of the universe. This testimony of Jesus, which is the truth, especially adapted for each generation, is needed for our prosperity, our, su our survival, and our salvation. May we receive the testimony of Jesus through open hearts and minds. Amen. So what did we just do on the subject of searching the scriptures?